As unfortunately often happens, the great achievements of human history often occur in moments that are not very edifying of our evolution. Our story begins in a small village in northern Germany during the Second World War. At Pena Monday, the Third Reich had built a site for the experimentation of new weapons that would have changed the fate of the war. Here, the V1 and V2 were developed, the forerunners of all ballistic missiles and space rockets of the modern age. The first V2 was successfully launched in March 1942 but despite sowing death and destruction, especially in England, they never changed the course of the conflict. Leading the Pienemunde site was Werner von Braun. In the spring of 1945, with the Red Army only 160 kilometers away, von Braun deserted and armed with false documents, allowed 500 technicians and scientists to surrender to the Allied forces. After several years of research in the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, in 1960, von Braun was appointed director of the Marshall Space Flight Center and was entrusted with the project for the construction of the Saturn V, the carrier that will bring the man for the first time on the moon. With the defeat of the Axis, two opposing blocs were formed, the Soviet One and the Atlantic Pact. It was the beginning of the Cold War, the nuclear arms race and missile technologies to launch these weapons against enemies. On October the 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union marvelled the world with the launch of the first artificial satellite, Sputnik 1, showing to be able to hit anywhere in the world. On the 12th of April 1961, the Soviet Union completed the first manned orbital flight. Yuri Gagarin, on board the Vostok 1 capsule, performed an elliptical orbit around the Earth, reaching a maximum altitude of 302 kilometers, traveling at a speed of 27,400 kilometers per hour. The United States were experiencing delays that only the words of the great leader, John F. Kennedy, could overcome. But why, some say, the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. It was the beginning of the Apollo program arrive at the moon by the end of the 60s. The first difficulty was to create a rocket that was powerful enough for the achievement. The Saturn project was born, entrusted to Von Braun. The first version, Saturn 1, makes 10 flights, mainly to test the first stage. It was followed by the Saturn 1B, which in its nine launches tested the Apollo technologies. And finally, the Saturn V, the most powerful rocket ever made by mankind. The chosen trajectory for almost all the Apollo missions was the one called Trajectory of Free Return, which by using the mutual gravitational forces of the Earth and the Moon would have allowed a considerable fuel saving. At the time, there were several theories on the consistency of the lunar surface. 
To understand this, NASA created the Surveyor Program. From 1966 until 1968, seven lunar landers were launched to the moon. It was necessary to demonstrate the possibility of a soft landing and collect images of the landing sites for the future missions. The development of the probes was entrusted to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and did not include any return to the Earth. Parts of Surveyor 3 were returned to Earth by Apollo 12 astronauts. John Hubolt, a NASA engineer, had another fundamental insight the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. Using a spacecraft consisting of a command module, top left, for the astronauts, a service module, bottom left, for air and fuel, and a lunar landing module, right. Hubolt vigorously defended his approach by convincing the director of NASA and von Braun himself. On the 16th of July, 1969, the United States was ready to conquer the moon. The previous missions had tested, even at great cost, all the phases of the mission. The unfortunate Apollo 1 that caused the death of the astronauts in a fire during a pre-flight test. Apollo 4, 5 and 6, unmanned missions to test the rocket and lunar module. Apollos 7, 8, 9 and 10, all with crew to test all the operations, moon landing ex expected. Ignition sequence has started. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off. At 8.32 a.m. Pacific time, from Platform 39 of the Kennedy Space Center, Apollo 11 took off with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins on board. Two minutes and 30 seconds later, the first stage of the Saturn V had brought the rocket to an altitude of 61 kilometers and a speed of 8,600 kilometers per hour. At this point, the five F1 engines were turned off and the first stage separated. The subsequent ignition of the second stage brought the crew in orbit around the Earth. At the end of the burn, the second stage was abandoned in space. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go for DLI, over. After two and a half hours and a series of checks, the third stage transferred the spacecraft into the lunar orbit. After three hours from the launch and en route to the moon, the crew had to perform one of the most complicated maneuvers of the mission the separation of the lunar module from the third stage of Saturn V. The manoeuvre was performed manually by the crew. The command module and the lunar module in this new configuration continued their journey to the moon. A journey that will last another 70 hours. Once in the proximity of our satellite, the engine of the service module was fired, slowing the spacecraft down and into lunar orbit. A 
200 hours from the launch, Armstrong and Aldrin positioned themselves inside the lunar module and separated from the command module, leaving Collins on his own in the command module. During the descent, the astronauts realised that the site of the landing was more rocky than the photographs had shown, and the onboard computer reported two alarms that Houston considered to be irrelevant for the continuation of the mission. Armstrong took semi-manual control of the capsule, which he landed at 2017 Greenwich Mean Time on the 20th of July 1969, with only 25 seconds worth of fuel left. Base here. The has Six and a half hours after touching down at 2.57, Armstrong made his descent to the surface and made his giant leap for mankind. Aldrin followed him shortly after, defining the lunar panorama a magnificent desolation. The extravehicular program was very intense. They had to do position the flag, take a phone call from the Oval Office, collect rock samples, and assemble the ALSEP, a series of scientific instruments to study the moon. Among these was a laser reflector that is still used today for measuring the Earth-Moon distance. The ALSEP was set up by the astronauts about 100 metres from the lunar module so that it would not be damaged during the takeoff. It consisted of various instruments including a seismometer, a magnetometer and an ion meter. The total duration of the extravehicular operations was two and a half hours. After the return to the lunar module, the astronauts had some difficulties due to the door now being too small for their inflated spacesuits. The astronauts were then ready for return to the Earth. Takeoff from the moon was at 1754. About four hours later, the command module and the lunar module met in orbit to begin the journey back to Earth. During this journey, the lunar module and the service mo module were no longer needed for the mission and will be abandoned in space. At 195 hours from the takeoff, on the 24th of July 1969, the command module began the delicate phase of re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. The friction would have brought the module to a temperature of 2,700 degrees Celsius, causing it to decelerate to a speed suitable for the opening of the three parachutes. Oh, my God. 
Shortly before the sunrise, the crew splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, 2,660 kilometres east of Wake Island and 24 kilometres away from the recovery ship, the aircraft carrier USS Hornet. The astronauts were recovered by helicopter and the spacecraft was transported aboard the ship. Today it is preserved at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington DC in memory of those glorious days. We cannot tell what the future holds, however the legacy of Apollo 11 must inspire us to new conquests and perhaps reach the moon. For those that follow us, it will no longer be an adventurous journey, but a pleasant trip to discover the wonderful places of this story. Mm -hmm.